Hey, hey, Marcus House with you here, and look at this. We have got some good indicators for the second Starship orbital flight test. This week, we've got tons more to share on the progress made toward that, but many more marvels of the week with inspiration and excitement no matter where you look. I think this is a constant reminder of our capacity to overcome challenges and explore the unknown. The fun never ends, so hold on tight and light that candle. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. So with all the exciting development in the previous week with that amazing static fire of Booster 9, we entered a new week watching the launch site for hints of news about the incredible Booster's next step. I will just say, you absolutely do need to check out the full video linked in the description of that static fire released just this week by Everyday Astronaut and Cosmic Perspective. This is actually just a snippet, but look here at the shockwaves and the acoustic vibrations in that slow motion comparison between Booster 7 without the water deluge system, and Booster 9 with those incredible vapor clouds. Amazing stuff. As mentioned last week, Booster 9 is now getting upgrades in the Mega Bay. One of the most important questions was where was that hot staging ring? Well, there it was, heading straight towards Booster 9. Interestingly enough, instead of the suspected dome for the exhaust deflector, they have chosen a more cone-like shape. Thanks to these amazing renders, we can see how all of that lines up with the engines on the ship. SpaceX actually just released these brilliant images of the new hot staging ring in place, and again with an incredible example of humans for scale. I've mentioned this before, but seeing this is more good evidence that during the hot staging, only the Raptor vacuum engines may ignite. This is because the sea level engines are very close to the top of the dome. Even when gimbaled out to their maximum, it doesn't look like they would adequately clear the deflection cone. On the topic of Raptor gimbling, SpaceX released this awesome video showing a Raptor performing a long duration burn at a 15 degree gimbling angle. It has been an intriguing week really because we've just this week had the first indications that we are truly in the end game of preparation for the second Starship flight. A notice to Mariners appeared showing a very tentative target is around August the 31st. With that, some coordinate data that we plotted onto a map. White here is for the launch area and green for the potential debris areas. Now, again, this is just one indicator and I would certainly expect these dates to move around, but it is an exciting exciting sign of intention. Interestingly though, new orbital launch mount base work has kicked off as teams began tearing out concrete right beside the steel deluge plate system. Now, I think we can assume that they are simply doing some touch-up work as it seems that there has been some cracking here. There's a chance that this occurred as a result of improper drying conditions and most likely showed up a week prior to the static fire. Another positive sign of progress was seeing new shielding being added to surround the newer staircase. That one was installed after the first flight, and the shielding here is now almost reaching up to the top. That is most likely in preparation for that second launch. Now, one discussed point there is whether Booster 9 will perform another static fire as its previous was sadly stopped after four engines aborted. Now, the reason for this abort is still not fully confirmed. However, after seeing a dozen tests of the Raptor Boost Quick Disconnects, eight last Saturday, followed by another four tests on Wednesday, we've got a reasonable guess why this may be. Perhaps instead of the Raptors themselves misbehaving, maybe there was issues with the startup gas supply pressure from the orbital launch mount. Just Friday evening, as we were getting this video ready to render, another massive test of the deluge system, and after Booster 9 rolls back out, we are expecting an attempt of the full 33 engine static fire again in just days. Over at the Rocket Garden, Ship 25, preparing for this next flight, was having steel plates installed covering over the old lifting points. These plates cover over the holes and they create a smooth surface to work with. However, for the side which faces the full brunt of the re-entry heating, these plates do not yet have the tiles installed. Given the fact that they are quite fragile, they must be installed once the plate itself is already fully bolted to the ship. Just like with the rest of the heat shield, first they add the tile pins for the standard tiles, followed by the white ceramic blankets for extra thermal insulation. Finally, on go the thermal protection tiles themselves. Now, for the non-hexagonal shaped tiles, the process can vary a bit. Usually for those, the thermal blankets aren't actually used and they are instead directly attached on with heat-resistant glue. 
This process is standard for ships and it was also carried out on ship 24, taking a couple of weeks from start to end each day, adding just one or two tiles. That was quite the process to watch actually. For ship 25, this has been a lot faster. Eventually, this process shouldn't be needed anymore because with the help of the two-point lifter system, SpaceX can simply remove the lifting points on the windward side, as we've seen on ship 29. Saying that, it looks like there's some more refinement of the two point lifter system still needed as it hasn't been used to stack ship 30. Speaking of, in went the thrust section into the high bay, shortly followed by it being stacked with the rest, completing yet another ship. Just at the back there on the ship engine installation stand is ship 28 receiving its Raptors. A new addition seems to be these custom made jigs, ensuring that the engines are secured better to its pallet. Booster 10 will most likely start receiving its engines as well. It was first moved from its temporary storage area in the rocket garden into the mega bay sitting where Booster 9 was at the back right corner. So only a few hundred metres away, RGV Aerial Photography was able to catch part of a new bridge crane being delivered to the production site with it most likely intended for the new mega bay once it has completed stacking. These bridge cranes are installed at the top of the interior and they're used for stacking stacking operations of the vehicles. Last week we mentioned the clear out of the ring yard all to prepare for the expansion of the LR11000 crane, the very same one to stack the gigantic sections of the mega bay. It was then swiftly pulled apart to almost its base components, however the machine deck was left intact. Indeed, it was being majorly reconfigured to reach much higher. A few days later, it rose back into the sky again. A true monster, and it will now be able to complete that job. Another big mega project is the Star Factory. It is of course all planned to eventually become one gigantic building. It'll also obviously fill the area of the old three production tents. Or should I say two, because yep, this week the middle tent was completely emptied out and within a few days fully flattened to the ground. In fact, we suspect that the tent closest to Highway 4 is going to be demolished shortly as well, as that is now empty too. The lights shut down and it's made entrance permanently open. Now we were finally treated to a rollout that we've all been waiting quite a while for. The nose cone assembly previously used for Ship 22 was moved out of the mid bay immediately heading onto Highway 4. You may recall me talking about this mystery nose many weeks ago as there was hints of this being a human landing system mock-up of some sort. Platforms in the past spotted nearby we suspect have also been installed into the nose forming a base of some sort for a cabin. I think it's safe to say that we could indeed be looking at a Starship crew variant mock-up. In this shot from Lab Padre's Rover 1 camera, we can see a pretty bizarre site with what looks to be a human-sized doorway, the likes of which we have never seen on a nose cone before. Normally when SpaceX teams enter and exit vehicles for interior work, we see these port-like structures that they can crawl into, but if we compare the height of this security guard to the door cut out here in this shot from Mary with NSF, this seems to be a door someone could just easily walk through, almost as if this is not just for the engineers working on the mock-up, but as a more permanent hatch for observers exploring this prototype. The nose cone assembly was moved out to just behind the payload processing facility and it was lifted into its final position a few hours later. Thanks a bunch to Starship Gazer streaming through this event, and of course to all of you out there helping to support his work on Patreon. So let's just zoom in here a little further. Take a look at this on the sides of the top ring of its stand. You can see a bunch of these support boxes that have been added. What exactly the purpose of all of these are is quite the mystery, but this one is a transformer made by Hammond Power Solutions. Now, does that label on the side there say HLS? And just on the right of that, another box that once again mentions HLS. The XFMR, by the way, is a widely used abbreviation for a transformer, so a few hints here and the labels had us pretty intrigued. It's worth considering that the HLS acronym could also mean something entirely different, such as human life support. We also spotted SpaceX move over what was previously a part of a booster header tank that was moved right next to this nose cone a few days later. Now, that part thankfully had a very clear label saying property of crew 
starship, not scrap. Another piece to the puzzle. The actual use of this part itself is still very much up in the air. Perhaps it could be part of a mock airlock leading in and out of the vehicle, or maybe a structure to be placed in the centre like some sort of radiation shelter. What do you think? You know, I don't know what it is exactly, but the excitement for this next flight seems to be even more infectious and positive than the first. I sent out a poll the other day on YouTube and X just to see what people thought, and the answer was very, very clear. I think there is a real sense of confidence with all the new upgrades, and we just cannot wait for this. Appreciate you taking the time to reply and vote on all this stuff, and also for confirming that you are indeed being unsubscribed here without doing so yourself. It is a little bewildering to me, I've got to say, but regardless, thanks for being here and supporting what the team and I do. Super appreciated. So it's been a while since we've had a bunch of updates to share around the Artemis 2 mission, but before diving into that, it's worth mentioning a few post-flight assessment updates on Artemis 1, which flew at the end of last year, of course. As we have just recently heard, there are concerns with the uneven heating and the ablation from the Artemis 1 heat shield. That is currently considered the biggest overhanging issue. They are also looking into some release and retention bolt problems, along with an electronics box on the service module being open. The SLS for Artemis 2 will be tested at NASA's Mishu Assembly Facility rather than at NASA's Stennis Space Center. They believe it will take a little longer to complete here because the vehicle is being worked on horizontally rather than vertically, which is interesting. They seem confident though that doing the testing there is a better option, so that should be complete by November. A major focus for Artemis 2 is obviously studying the effect of deep space radiation on the crew. Although they have measured some useful data from Artemis 1, NASA feel that they are in a position where only crewed missions can further this research. It is super important, obviously, that they can find the right balance between pushing the envelope for the spacecraft without endangering the crew. I mean, just think about how important these next missions are. Make no mistake, going to the moon is dangerous. I still think that it is a freaking miracle that the Apollo missions went as smoothly as they did. The South Pole, though, is actually even more dangerous. Why is that? Well, firstly, the terrain is much more hazardous than the equatorial landing sites picked for the Apollo landings. Larger craters for one, but think about the lighting conditions alone. You can end up entirely out of light as you are coming in to touch down. With no atmosphere, you could be getting blasted with full sunlight and an instant later complete darkness. That is yet again another reason that I'm so interested in Chandrayaan 3's upcoming landing attempt. This is tricky stuff. Slow and steady will not just win the race, but provide the greatest chance that everyone comes home safe. Looking even further forward to Artemis 3, this is where Starship becomes critical. NASA recently checked in at Starbase to see where SpaceX was at and received an updated timeline. They are still aiming for December 2025 with current contracts being held to that time frame, although some projects are projected to be a few weeks behind. The orbital uncrewed demo flight and propellant transfer are still top priorities, and obviously NASA's selected spacesuit needs to hit the required milestones. Interestingly, NASA did mention an alternative if the human landing system was delayed, with smaller, easier objectives to keep the crew missions flowing. One option is a longer duration deep space gateway style orbit around the moon that would at least allow NASA and the astronauts to get more familiar and confident with Orion. Artemis 2, in comparison, is never actually entering an orbit of the moon. It will instead do three orbits of Earth. The first, a little over 2,000 kilometers in low Earth orbit. Here, it will sit for about 90 minutes to do all the needed checkouts. The next orbit will push that apogee up over 60,000 kilometers, which would still allow them to come back and re-enter after 24 hours if something was not going to plan. Finally, the translunar injection burn. This will push them up into what is called a free return trajectory. Mission Commander Reed Wiseman describes that burn as essentially one that also doubles as a deorbit burn. At this point, even if there was an issue with primary propulsion, they can make any tiny trajectory adjustments needed with the reaction control systems. It isn't just work on the SLS and Orion, obviously. Just the other day, NASA showed scenes of Crawler Transporter 2 moving underneath the Mobile Launcher 1. This performed a few tests just before rolling out to Pad 39B. After requiring a bunch of upgrades, it needed to be tested at the pad for Artemis 2. That was all breaking late this week. 
Now, I think one important thing to mention is that NASA is being a little more vocal about the crewed race to the lunar surface. Although it is true that the race to be the first to have humans on the moon is over, the race to have a permanent base at the lunar south pole is only just beginning. Let's not forget, China alone plans to put astronauts on the moon before 2030, and they are making astounding progress toward that goal. Another Starlink mission launched this week. This was the live view from the East Coast here as Booster 1067 prepared for launch at Space Launch Complex 40. There was supposed to be back-to-back -back launches with another from the other side of the country at Vandenberg, but that ended up scrubbed due to Hurricane Hillary impacting the recovery operations. That would have been cool to see as they were launching only hours apart. Instead though, we just had the one screaming through Max-Q in all its glory. We've just got to check out that always fantastic main engine cutoff and stage separation shot, and it's the perfect time, I think, to show this graph here by Bryce Tech. SpaceX in quarter two launched over nine times the mass than the China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation shown in second place here. Ariane Space and ULA need to be zoomed right in just to be able to see them properly. This is crazy, right? And there is fairing separation and a bunch more mass to add to that infographic. This booster was flying for the 13th time and touching down on the drone ship a shortfall of Gravitas, a favourite drone ship of mine simply because it looks like something out of Batman, doesn't it? Now that was it for the live stream. As is routine at this point, no views of the Starlink deployment, but confirmation was posted later on X. In fact, we've only ever seen the deployment of those version 2 minis once, and it sure would be great if SpaceX would let us see that action one more time. Now, about a year ago, you may recall this image captured by the Hubble Space Telescope was making news around the internet because it was the most distant star that we've ever seen. Estimated to be a staggering 12.9 billion light years away, this star was named Arendelle. Why do I bring this up though? Well, the James Webb Space Telescope made a follow-up observation of the cluster imaginatively named WHL 0137-08. More on that shortly, but first, a massive thank you to AG1 for sponsoring this video, a great way to support your immune system and take ownership of your health. Living the life that I do indoors, busily making content, it is so easy for me to end up lacking a bunch of important vitamins and minerals. During those short winter days in Tasmania, I barely even get to see sunlight. Luckily, we are coming out of that cold weather now shortly, but yes, to counteract this, I typically take a bunch of supplements, especially vitamin D as part of my daily sort of routine. How many other vitamins and minerals are missing from my diet though? It can be pretty hard to tell. Well, by drinking AG1, that has me hitting the ground running without taking a bunch of separate supplements. Since using it, I've been pretty impressed. I just pop one scoop of AG1 in water and drink it down as part of my morning routine. With it, I just feel clearer and more focused throughout the day. And that makes sense because it's packed with vitamins, minerals, and nutrients to support health and energy levels. I mean, just look at the stuff packed into this one drink. AG1 also supports adrenal health and brain recovery, which is perfect in those weeks where I'm burnt out. Certainly great for those crazy weeks. We'll probably be having a few of those quite soon with this second Starship flight going on. So yes, add AG1 to your morning routine. Head to drinkag1.com slash Marcus House and get an added one year supply of immune supporting D3K2 and five travel packs for free. Thank you, AG1. So yes, back to this massive cluster of galaxies that lies between Earth and Arendelle. This essentially acts as a magnifying glass, bending the fabric of space and time so significantly that it amplifies the light from the distant objects behind it. Towards the bottom right here, you can make out a thin arc somewhat resembling a rising sun, now nicknamed the Sunrise Arc Galaxy. Within that was the Arendelle star. Now, it's just amazing to me that we can see something that far away using some of these tricks. Interestingly, scientists now think that Arendelle could actually be two stars, and that is firstly because stars this massive do tend to have a companion star, but also astronomers can see hints of what could be a cooler companion star in the James Webb data. As a quick side note, the similar points of light that you can see on either side are apparently giant star clusters within the galaxy, and the stretched ends here are new star forming regions. 
Now we've also been receiving some neat progress updates about the Mars Sample Return Program. Just in the last few months, the solid rocket motors of the Mars Ascent Vehicle, or MAV that will carry samples from the Martian surface, have been successfully tested. That means that this little rocket design could indeed be the first one to lift off from another planet. Well, that is all assuming that the entire mission plan is not cancelled due to budget issues. You might recall that we talked about that a few weeks ago. This unit that we are looking at right here is the MAV's first stage solid rocket engine SRM-1 being tested in a vacuum chamber at negative 20 degrees C. They are trying to test this in a similar harsh environment that it would be facing when lifting off from Mars itself. The second rocket motor, SRM-2, will then blast off to get the samples to the Earth return orbiter. Now in this one, you can see the test motor igniting and then spinning at about 200 RPM. They do that to help stabilize the vehicle with that gyroscopic effect. That is such a cool looking shot. Both of those tests were totally successful, so it's neat progress as NASA works on the Mars sample retrieval lander that will of course land with the MAV. These are just some shots shared days ago showing some drop tests being performed with this test article to make sure that the leg design is ready for Mars. Don't be fooled by that scale by the way. This is just one third the size of the actual lander, which will be the largest lander ever seen to Mars. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to hit subscribe so we get to keep making them. If you would like to help more directly like all these many, many people, all this support makes a colossal difference to us. It really does. If you want to continue with more space goodness, the algorithm thinks that you will enjoy this video here next, or maybe these videos. Thanks for watching all this way through, and I'll see you all in the next video.